Praise the Lord. Turn your Bible with me, if you will, to Daniel, the fifth chapter. I want to I want to share something that I want you to continue to pray with us about. I shared with you a motto, a principle that I'm not going to say I made it up, but I'm I don't remember ever hearing anybody else saying it, but I configured a principle in my mind that I live by, and that is. The opportunity of a lifetime is captured in the lifetime of the opportunity. I'll say it again. The opportunity of a lifetime is captured in the lifetime of the opportunity. The opportunities that avail itself today may not come tomorrow. The opportunities to serve, sacrifice, to be sent of the Lord with purpose into a place, a case, a situation, is uh, captured in that moment of opportunity. Don't ever think or say to yourself, you know what, I know God is dealing with me today about this, but I'm going to put it off until a future date. That opportunity may not come again like it did today. I'm going to show you one little verse in the Bible How many ever heard preachers talking about Lot's wife and how she was looking back in fear and the salt overtook her and she became a pillar of salt? Long before the warning was don't, don't look back in fear. There was a warning that came the night before when the angel of the Lord came in to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and says to Lot, Lot, Get you and your household out of these cities. For we have come to bring judgment and we will destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's, let's get out. But the Bible said they, they Lot did not leave that night, but they spent the night there. And even the next morning, the Bible says, and while Lot lingered, that one word lingered while he waited, while he hesitated, while he procrastinated. It said, Lot lingered till the angels of the Lord had to grab them by the hands and began to pull them out of the city. Forced them. How many times have we not yielded to the voice of the Holy Spirit to do something tonight? To pray, to minister, to talk to someone. And we, we, something caused us to hesitate, to linger, to procrastinate, only to not have that opportunity avail itself again. Now this is not my message, but it's my pre-message. We have an opportunity here. But let me, let, me, let me just finish that. A lot of people, they, they've always put the blame on Lot's wife and say, you know, in fear she looked back. But let me just share something with you. If Lot had left the night before, Lot would have not lost his wife the next day. And there's a lot of us that it's quick to blame the person who becomes the victim of Lot's lingering. Why did they wait? Why did they hesitate? She was waiting on him. And he waited too long and put his whole family in a vulnerable victimizing stage. How many understand that? while he lingered. I want to say something to you. Dads, moms, let's not linger. Opportunity avails us. We have opportunity right now to feed hundreds, thousands of children at no expense, at no cost to us. Service sacrificed by us, we can by a group and partner with a group over on the other side. Partner with us to feed children every single day Hungry children that do not normally get a supper or a second meal. They, they, uh, I'm not talking about, now, I know there's people that minister to the homeless and we recognize that's a great need. But this is not what this is. This is for mothers with children, single mothers, uh, uh, mothers whose husbands are incarcerated, mothers who uh, are on a set income. And even every one of you that have children, 
from 18 down to 3. If you do not financially have the availability and you would like to you would like to have a dinner right here. I'm talking about a full dinner right here. Served by us, prepared by these professionals and they bring it here and we serve it. I believe in God there will come a day in the very near future when every day there will be meals served. Complete meal suffers to hungry children that will not have to go to bed hungry one more day. Amen? And if this doesn't touch your heart, then you're not real touchable. There is children all over this high desert who go to bed hungry every night and wonder where the next meal is going to come from. And we can partner and God has blessed us with the opportunity to help those. We have other things in line that we're trying to work out in this situation. Uh, pray for us about that. The renting of our, of our kitchen so that they can prepare thousands of meals all over the high desert and down in San Bernardino and Riverside. Right now they, they serve and we will partner with a group that serves over 12,000 children meals every day. I, I'm talking about, uh, they probably uh, and serve up to three meals, but 12,000 children. Sometimes as many as 20,000 meals a day. Amen. Amen. So I want to share with you today, I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to pray with me about it. Many of you have responded and said, I want to be a part of that. I want to come every day and serve. So we're going to have to move into a level of excellence that we have never uh, stepped up to previous to this. And uh, I'm going to talk about this in the message today. When the opportunity avails itself and we come to that moment that we have to step up. We have to do better than we've done before. We have to accelerate the pace. We have to, we, I can come up with all kinds of terms. I just keep on going. But let me just say this. Now is the hour, right now, that we make a deliberate choice in our hearts. This is something that we want to do. This is something that God has placed before us. And he's given us opportunity to feed hungry people. Amen? How many, how many want to be a part? Of, of serving and caring for hungry children yes. in this high desert. I'm not just talking about babies. I'm talking about people all the way from 18 years old, amen, down to uh, two and three years old, amen, and those mothers. Then I believe in God, and we have no sponsors, we have no funding, but I believe in God in the near future that every single day we're going to be able to feed a meal to senior citizens. Yeah. Amen. amen. I do not know how we're going to do it, but it's in my heart that people that, that are on a set income can come to this church every single day and get a wholesome, wonderfully cooked, professionally cooked meal and, and be seated in that lovely restaurant next door and have a prepared meal and, and, and go home and not face hunger that night because their income does not provide them with the means of having proper food and nourishment. So would you join me in that? Amen. God has spoke to me that if we would step up and he was talking to me. And I know, I know that as a pastor, uh, you may think it's, it's uh, comfortable or convenient. Uh, like Moses, when Moses said, you know, God speaks to me. Well, it's, it's not easy when God begins to deal with me about stretching the vision. It's not easy knowing I have to come and talk to people that is maybe not ready to be stretched. That that's not, you feel like you're so encumbered and filled with so many things that you're doing right now in your life, you have no more time. Let me say something to you. If you'll make time for others, God will open your calendar. Amen. He will bless you with the invested time. And uh, last week I shared a little story and I had a crock pot out here and I shared with you that uh, in a crock pot just like that, Brother George. George, just raise your hand again. I, I'm sorry if I'm embarrassing you, but he's been in the food ministry. How many years, George? About 54 years. 54 years serving people. But when they, when they rented that first building, a little building, there was nothing in the building, nothing left in that building 
but one little crock pot. And he looked up the Lord and said, Lord, how do we how do we do what you call us to do with we don't have anything? And the Lord said, What do you have? And they looked around, all they have is one little crock pot. God said, Start with what you have in your hand. And they began to cook a meal for six people. Started out with six people. That crock pot still works. And I'm sure they used other crock pots as well as that one. But starting with that crock pot, they served over 360,000 meals. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> oh, come on, folks. That's worthy of a, a clap of appreciation. Hallelujah. Turn your Bible with me, if you will, to Daniel, the fifth chapter. Make this a matter of prayer. Come up to me after service if you want to be a part of that. I want to thank all you young people that have come to me and said, I want to be a part of that, Pastor. I, 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 want, to, I want to invest my life in to serving these children. I want, I want to go back there and serve. And, and every day, I'd like, to, I'd like to come home from school, some of you said it, and go over there and, and when I can and serve the children. Amen? Praise God. Daniel, the fifth chapter. I'm going to be talking about an excellent spirit. Praise Lord. I'm looking for my... my uh, there it is. Robert, could you move the podium over today? I want to come down with you today. And I do want to say, I was so blessed last Sunday night when Brother Carlos still preached a message on the hope of the believer on the coming of Jesus Christ and the bride of Christ being ready for Jesus coming. Stirred up something in my soul. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. How many's glad for the day? Now, I'm not talking about some superficial thing like you got your bamboo pole ready and you're going to stick it in the river of life and sit there all day humming old hymns and, and put your dirty worm down in the crystal stream. I, I don't want to hear something like that. But how many know one day we're going to be with the Lord in His presence, in His power? Forever to be with Him. Amen. I'm so glad that, that one day, and I, I loved, it's been a while since I heard the message on, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there will you be also. For in my Father's house are many mansions. I don't care if you want to categorize in many rooms or many places. I guarantee you, if that city that is four square is has has pearl, full pearl gates and and walls of jasper and streets of pure gold. Uh, I guarantee you the shabby sheetrock that we have ain't gonna compare. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And and we used to sing that old song so silly. Just give me a cabin in the corner of glory. Like they're gonna build some shanty shack for you, and everybody else is gonna have mansions. Come on, folks. We're going to the house of the Lord. Yes. Amen. Yes. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not true, I, I wouldn't have told you this. But I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you may be also. Amen. I don't know how. I don't know when. But I know this. If he promised. Amen. Amen. He's prepared a place for us. I want to say one more thing about that. If in six days, and a lot of people don't believe that, that he created the heavens and the earth and then stepped back on the seventh and rested, not because he was tired, but because he was finished. And he stepped back, and because he didn't have nobody else to compliment him, he complimented himself and say, it's good. Yeah. Amen. 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 He had, you know, uh, he just stepped back and said, I did a good job here. Yeah. Amen. If in those span of times, I don't know if it was seven actual days or whatever, but if, if in that span of time, and I believe that he did create the world, can you imagine God preparing a place for us in over 2,000 years? He's been preparing a place for his bride and his children. Amen. I, I get tingly when I think about that. He's prepared a place for us. I have not seen and ear have not heard. It's been recorded in the heart of man. But God has prepared for his people. But the Holy Spirit will reveal it 
unto us. How many know God's getting ready to reveal through the power of the Holy Spirit the great things God's prepared? All right, Daniel 5. An excellent spirit. I'm going to give you a small description of what's happening, the scenario. Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, is having a party. Belshazzar, while he's tasting the wine, he commands them to bring the vessels, gold and silver vessels, which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple there in Jerusalem. That the king and his prince and his wives and his concubines might drink therein. And then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his prince and his wives and his concubines drank in them. And they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. But in that same hour, there come forth the fingers of a man's hand. And it rolled over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed. And his thoughts troubled him. So that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote once against another. And the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. But none of the wise men could read the writings, nor make known the interpretation. The king was deeply troubled. His countenance was so changed that his lords were astonished. The Bible says, <coughs> this king was so shook up and fear was written on his face to such a degree those who had seen him point his finger and create judgments and this one dies and this one lives and this one rises and this one falls at his command. Now his knees are shaking violently. His loins, his, his hip areas are literally coming disconnected. I mean he's shaking so violently. Fear is riddled his body and his mind. And those who once knew him as this confident authoritative figure now is astonished that here is a man whose, whose authority has crumbled and his, his emotions have shattered and his mind is quaking and they can see fear written all over him. It wasn't like he didn't know what was getting ready to happen. I'm going to say a few things here that if it shakes up your religious theories right now and you've you have and I'm not saying this condemning I'm saying this in the deepest love you have compromised to such a degree that all you want is preaching about heaven never mention hell preaching about rewards of good and not consequences of bad you want me to only preach about uh, uh, being sweet and nice and giving the devil, you know, room and opportunity. Uh, I got news for you. I'm in a war. Amen. And the enemy is trying to take out you from the house of God. The enemy is trying to take out your children. And these palsy, pablum puking games that we've been playing. For so long to pacify, to make sure we don't offend anybody, putting them on our shoulders spiritually and pampering them and patting them on the back and, and uh, feeding them baby pablum for years instead of saying, it's time to grow up. It's time to face reality. There'll be people sitting right here who are a student and have great the theological understanding but will miss the fact that one day you will reap what you have sown. 
You will face the consequences for your actions. How many understand that? And I'm not going to back up from preaching. We in America, like Belshazzar on that day, have foolishly played a game that we can have a party and live a party life and God will not crash that party. How many ever heard of a party crasher? A party crasher, somebody give me your definition right after I give you mine. A party crasher is an uninvited guest. Uh, when they come to your party, uh, you didn't invite them. You didn't ask them to come in. They came in on their own desire. More fights. More shootings. More knivings. And parties have started. Because someone looked at someone and said, what are you doing here? And when confronted, they just said, well, we just heard there was beer, booze, and as my guests and girls, we, we just dropped in. And they are maybe, first of all, politely asked to leave, and if they don't leave, then things begin to happen. Well, you might can throw some people out of a party, but when God steps into a room, better get ready. When God crashes your party, you're not throwing him out. He's not, he's not uh, listening to your feeble request that you don't show up, that he don't show up or that he leaves because you, you don't want the awkwardness of his person and presence at that party. I want to say something here this morning. We're living in a time when we have, without a doubt, know what happens to our children, last generation, the generation before, and the generation before. When we do not face the truths of God's word, that when we take the sacred things of God and we misuse them. See, this was not the first warning. This was not the first time. His, uh, many say it was his father, but I think it was his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. Years had gone by, but uh, when he stopped to remember, I believe that's why his knees began to shake. What happened to his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, who when he took these very vessels and, and he was having a party. And God turned him over. I said, God, not the devil, God turned his mind over to his own devices and let him think about it for a while and he descended until he lay out in fields like a cow and chewed the grass of the fields and said his mind he, he literally went insane without the hand of God upon his life he literally went insane but the Bible said there came a day he remembered the God he remembered God and he came to his senses and he repented. It wasn't God that, that caused him to go down. It was his own insane practices that continued to drive him crazy till he literally stooped to the lowest point. I want to say something to you. Yes, there is the mercies of God. Yes, there is the kindness and the grace of God. It, there is the unmerited favor of God and I don't want to belittle that. Uh, his mercies endure forever. But I'm going to tell you something. Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but he came to save the world. But if a man is condemned, it's condemned because he condemns himself. By not making the deliberate choice to accept Jesus Christ, his principles, his truth, and his person into their hearts. We live in a day we want to sidestep the issue. We want to play, play a little game like come up and repeat a prayer after me and shake my hand and you're going to be all right. Without telling you, you need to get on your face. You need to repent of your sins that have separated you from God. You need to stay on your knees until the transforming power of God changes you from the top of your head to the sole of your feet till you have wet your way into His presence. And you're ready to change and you're ready to let Him change you. Amen? Well, immediately, 
But because I'm preaching a message that is still wrapped and entwined in grace and mercy, somebody's going to walk out of here and the only thing they're going to hear is, man, you were, you were hard this morning. No, I'm being real this morning. Now, I'm not to the good part of this message yet. The Bible said that in verse 10, Now the queen, by reason of the words of the kings and lords, came into the banquet house, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever, and let not thy thoughts trouble you. Don't, don't worry about this. You're the king. Now, I don't care. And if you get mad at me, I will hug your neck and forgive you. But I don't care if Michelle walks up to Obama today and hugs, the, I said the queen, and hugs his, hugs his neck and says, don't worry about God's principles. Don't worry about the consequences. You're doing a good job. You're a Democrat. And you're doing an awesome job and don't worry about what anybody says. And I'm talking about every, every queen on the Congress slot. I, I'm talking about every senator's wife. I'm talking about every House of Representatives wife. There's going to come a day when, when, when the shaking of our knees, we realize we're getting ready to face the consequences of our actions, our decisions, our rulings, every mandate that we set down. Now, I, I know this is a lot to pile up on you, but the queen said, Oh, king, you live forever. Don't let your thoughts trouble you. I'm praying beyond the consoling words of their wives. Every man in the House of Congress, every senator, and our president himself, their knees will shake in the fact that one day America is going to face the same consequences of our actions. And no words can console them. Nobody's going to be able to pamper them and, and give them a, a sleeping pill and, and everything's okay. I'm praying their souls are troubled for sending every child to a premature death, even in a mother's womb. I'm praying for every belittling and bias and prejudice act that we have done to belittle women or minorities or children will be brought consequences. Oh yes, don't think we as a nation didn't pay a high price for our actions of slavery. Oh, we don't want to talk about it today. But do you realize over 500,000 men died because of our actions of having men as slaves? Oh, yes, we paid a high price. America. Don't you wish you went to some liberal church today? guys are weird. I take my coat off. <laughs> you think I'm going to start like... <laughs> I was just getting warm, that's all. <laughs> Don't let your countenance be changed. Don't be troubled. There's a man in the kingdom. There's a man in this kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods and in the days of thy father light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods was found in him in whom King Nebuchadnezzar thy father the king I say thy father made master of magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans and soothsayers. He said I know you still have the same group around you that your grandfather had. The Chaldeans and the soothsayers and the, and the men of wisdom and the astrologers and all those men. But I want you to know you still got a man here who was there that told your grandfather Nebuchadnezzar, you better watch out. For as much as he has an excellent spirit, he has an excellent spirit. And knowledge and understanding, interpreting dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in this man Daniel, whom the king called Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and he will show you the interpretation. There's something there that I want you to see and I want to key in on today. She started out by saying, don't be afraid. Now, I know if we look back through the course of history, you had the same 
bunch that told you everything was going to be okay and it wasn't okay back then. And yet the same guys that consoled him and pat him on the back, back your grandfather, and, and he went down to destruction and had to repent and, and picked himself back up by the mercies of God. But you need to understand, you still have that same passive you have that same complimenting. You got that same group that tried to, con to console your grandfather and his sins, but the same man that called this nation to judgment in those days is still in the house. His name is Daniel. And he has an excellent spirit. He has knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams, showing of hard sentences, or he, he was a man that could, they, they would come in with riddles or things that was hard to discern. And he said, he, they're not a riddle, they're not, you come up with all kinds of, you know, like questions and he, he's going he's gonna to give you the answer. And he, he's a problem solver. This man is a dissolver of doubts. I want to key in on these different things here this morning. First of all, the spirit of excellence. I, I want that to be the main feature of this message. When faced in this generation, I know there's still the same group that's going to always cry and always whine and always complain. But there is in this group a man and a woman. There's someone still left today that's going to stand up and say the same God that brought your grandfather Nebuchadnezzar out of his craziness is going to bring you out of yours. I didn't say bring judgment that was going to destroy you. You have to understand the final consequence was God brought him back to his right mind. God brought him back to the kingdom and reestablished him. A lot of people only want to talk about the judgment. Let's talk about how God turned that whole nation around. He said the same man the same man that helped bring this nation back to a place where it should be. And though you've fallen back into the same sins of your fathers, the same man that helped bring this nation back to their knees and back to God is still in the house. I want to say to you, there's got to be someone in America left today. There's got to be someone in this house who is God has placed in this church, who's placed in this high desert, who's going to turn men and women back to God. There's got to be someone here, even though judgment is a part of the equation. The grace and the mercies of God that is displayed in their excellent spirit will draw this high desert. I'm talking about us. I, I, I don't know about everybody else, but somebody needs to rise up. A Daniel, a man or a woman with a spirit of excellence. Now, when you begin to talk about excellence... Uh, you get some strange interpretations. But it means, now, now let me just share, you, a lot of people think that excellence means success, but it doesn't. Success means being the best. In most people's eyes, excellence means being the best you can be. Success means being better than everyone else. Excellence means being better, you, you being better today than you were yesterday. Success means, in most people's eyes, the achievement, exceeding the achievements of everyone else. Where excellence means you excel beyond what you did yesterday and you accomplish more than you used to do. He had an excellent spirit. It would, and, and, and when you go over to the next chapter, when it begins to talk about it, as he begins to minister to them in the sixth chapter, it is said that his excellent spirit. Now, we're not talking about capital S, the Holy Spirit. We're talking about his attitude. We're talking about his mindset. He was a man of excellence. I, uh, I know when everything is done in excellence. And I know when it's not. So do you. I know when people just throw their their sermons together or they just throw their song together they don't practice they don't study they don't they um, come on you know you know what I'm talking about 
And you know when, when you go to work and the guy, he always comes in late. And he's the first one 30 minutes before, 30 minutes before it's time to go home. He's already sneaking over into the snack room or whatever and putting his stuff and getting ready. So the, the second the buzzer goes off or the bell rings, he's running out the door. He's spending time sneaking over to people. He's oh, always got that other thing going. He's got that, he's selling insurance or he's selling something and he's always talking to people over on the site. It has nothing to do about what his employer is paying him to do. He always has his own agenda. He's always using everybody else's time and everybody else's money to provide his own agenda. And the same thing is in church. I, I'm some dumb, but I'm not pumped up. I've been around a while. And I know the ins and outs of small churches and large churches. And I know how it works. But every once in a while, you run into that person with an excellent spirit. They're there to serve. They're not there to get their own agenda recognized. They're there to share the vision and the load. And get the work of God accomplished in the house. And I thank God for people of an excellent spirit. I thank God for a people who pursue with all of their heart to be excellent in everything they do. You have to ask the question, was he a man of excellence and they seek that excellence in him because of his surroundings or his upbringing? No. As a teenager, he was taken as a slave. He was brought out of his homelands with three of his buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were brought before the king because of their, their, their handsome countenance and their intelligence. They were the choices of the choice. What uh, he did, now listen to this. In this slave capacity, he grew up to be a man who became a leader in a foreign country. Went from being a slave to an ambassador to one of the presidents. There was three presidents over all the land. And he was one of the three. Now, we can all look at our background and say, well, you know, i got a right. And, and nobody get offended at me. I, I'm just laying it out. We, we can look at our background and say, I was raised poor. I was raised without an education. I was raised uh, with abusive parents. I was raised with alcoholics. I was raised with drug addicts. I was raised with... Uh, perversion all around me. I was abused. I was misused. I was molested. I was raped. And then it just goes on and on and on. And, and, and we keep, keep living under that, under that covering of this is the reason I am like I am. I live like I live. And I act like I act. But there comes a day you can realize, wait a minute. I do not have to live in conjunction or in accordance with what has happened to me. I can live in conjunction of words of what's happened in me. Amen. God has done a transforming work. The world may have crushed me, but Jesus has saved me. The world may have molested me, but Jesus has embraced me. The world may have abused me, but God has abundantly blessed me. So I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit giving credence, I'm going to quit giving attention and recognition to all the things that made me the hurting, miserable, misused, molested, broken individual that I claim to be. No, you're a child of God in whom the spirit of excellence, the Holy Spirit, dwells in you. And you become a vessel of excellence when you realize you are not children of the enemy or children of the corn or children of the craziness. You're a children of the Most High God. And you determine after what's happened in you what happens through you. Everybody wants to excuse what happened to me is why I act like what happens through me. Why I talk like I talk. Why I'm always angry. I'm always irritable. I'm always feeling bad. Why don't you break those chains and, and say today I'm a child of God. Today I know that in me is the most ex the excellent one. He lives and dwells in me. And I'm going to deliberately begin to act and talk and live in the excellence that the transforming power of God has placed in me. Somebody's getting healed right now. 
Glory to God. I said somebody is getting healed right now. Because they're making a very great decision to drop all that stuff that happened to them. And rely on what's happened in them. Somebody that needs a transforming power of God to heal those things that's, that's happened to you. They're still, they're there, but God's going to break those chains. I just want you to lift hands right down and see. Amen. The Lord, heal me. Set me free. Break those chains in me. Hallelujah. An excellent spirit. Now, first of all, he was brought up in the Lord, the ways of the Lord. But in this situation, he couldn't allow, he couldn't allow and he couldn't rely on others to lead him when he was in slavery. He had to step up and become excellent in opposition to everything that had happened to him. There's a great preacher named Rob Thompson, who pastors in Chicago. Anybody heard of Rob Thompson? Uh, Rob Thompson is, is one of the greatest men of excellence. But uh, he found the Lord in a mental institution. Fifteen years old. By fifteen he was a drug addict, an alcoholic. His parents were alcoholic. He said, we lived in the most... He said, I would know when, the, when, when, when my mother or my father would go on a binge. He said, I would come in from school and there would be clothes piled everywhere. And, and they would be on ranting and raving, uh, you know, screaming and hollering and craziness would go on. And he said, this would go on for months. And he said, you knew when the spirit of that which controlled them and happened to them, uh, it influenced the whole house. It would be crazy. Things would pile up. It would look like a, it looked like a hoarders lived there. And then when they'd sober up, everything would clean up for a little while. And there's a lot of folks who live the same way. It is sure quiet in here. Uh, while um, uh, you're allowing those things to happen to you, you react and respond in that way. But an excellent spirit, somebody say an excellent spirit. An excellent spirit says, I'm not going to let what happens to me affect what happens through me. From this day forward, I may be a slave as far as uh, to taxes here in America, and I may I may have my you know my my barriers of things that they say I cannot say. But at a certain point, I cannot rely on this government. I cannot rely on this nation. I can't rely on other people to determine what comes through me, what challenges me, what what brings me to a level of excellence where everybody else just succumbs to the pressure of this world. Okay, I won't work. I'll just go food stamps. Uh, no, I won't get a job. I'll just quit looking. Let me tell you something. Shake yourself. Shake yourself. Come up here and let us pray for you. Go get that job. Work your way through to success. More importantly, work your way back to excellence of spirit. The pursuit of excellence is gratifying and healthy. The pursuit of perfection is frustrating, neurotic, and a terrible waste of time. I'll say it again. The pursuit of excellence, of being the best you can be, being all God's called you to be, fulfilling the purpose God has called you, is healthy and invigorating and gratifying. But trying to be perfect is neurotic, Frustrating and going to leave you basically incapacitated mentally and emotionally. But I come to tell you, there's none perfect but Jesus. There was no perfect ones. But, but excellence you can have. Amen? And you stand perfect before Him and His righteousness. But we all know who you are and you know who you are. You need to begin to, begin to move toward an excellent spirit. So he had an excellent spirit, and then it began to describe that spirit. It said it, it, it was a spirit that had understanding and knowledge and, and a dissolver of doubts and a problem solver. I believe that in this generation there's going to be somebody that realizes that America has gone through some difficult days. We went through the Civil War, we went through World War I, we went through World War II, we went through uh, the Korean conflict in the 50s, we went through Vietnam in the 60s. 
we went through Afghanistan, Iraq, and I can't even tell you how many other, uh, you know, in 1999 and 2000, the, the uh, uh, what was the uh, invasion of some place, we went into one of those Arab states, and, and uh, it's just been on and on and on. But at some point, in every generation, God has a Daniel. In every generation, God has somebody who's going to read the handwriting on the wall and say, we are weighed in the balance and found wanted. As a nation, we're going to have to stop and look at ourselves. But let's not, let's not look at the church, at, you know, at the Congress as a leadership for the church. They should not be telling us what to do. We ought to be relying on God to tell us what to do. Amen? I am not a man of, of stubborn resistance to government. I'm not, a, I'm not a guy that's going to stand up here and say, okay, we're all moving to Ghana because this nation has gone to hell in a handbasket. We're not going to do that. Nor are we going to serve Kool-Aid at the end of the service. <laughs> what we're going to do is with the spirit of Daniel, where God has placed us, is rise up. Say beyond the frustration and beyond the hurt and beyond the absolute un unrecognizing of, of, of America's people. They do what they want, when they want, how they want. But one day they're going to realize that we weren't in control in the first place. God was. In God we trust. Amen. It was God that established this nation. And if we're going to bring it back to a place, then there's got to be a Daniel. There's got to be someone of a spirit of excellence. Who will rise up and say, it doesn't matter how I was brought up. Like Rob Thompson, he said, but when God saved me, all those characteristics with, that came with a dysfunctional family, I had to break. With the Spirit of God's help, I had to break one by one by one every chain that kept me from living in excellence. We always want God to do for us what we will not do for ourselves. I'm going to say some things right now. You want to ch break the chains of addiction, alcoholism, drug addiction, perversion, pornography? You need to take a step of repentance. Get on your face and say, God, I'm sorry for the sin that is in my life. And for the chains I've allowed to captivate me. And with your help, I will start the chain breaking process. God, with your help, and I'm relying on you, but I'm coming to you for help. I'm making a deliberate decision to not let this be the responding factor of my life. I'm going to quit responding to all this. Every time a temptation or a struggle or a cycle comes back around. There's some folks that have quit drinking 89 times. <laughs> but at the same time, there's people that have quit trying to be negative and speak badly to your wife or your husband a hundred times. There's people who are so dysfunctional that scream and yell at your children all the time. Smile, folks. This message is for you to take to someone else who needs it. This is not for you. This is for you to share. Okay. He was excellent because he had a hunger for God. Some people only want to know enough to get by. But he wanted to know God in such a way that when it comes to things that were uninterpretable, things that were misunderstood, he had a way of clarifying it. Amen? Oh, uh, he, not only that, but he had an outstanding walk with God. That when he and his three buddies were put up to the test, you're going to deny God, they refused. There is people of excellence today who are not going to fall or compromise in this generation. It's easy to just say, okay, look, we've got all of our children, and I'm not just talking about yours, I'm talking about mine, weighed in the balance. And it'd be quick to say, okay, now listen to me close. I'm, I'm talking about Ron Faulkner here. I've talked, but I've talked to one, I've talked to 30, if not 50, 
families in this church and all of us deal with the same hurts and wounds. We look at the actions and the course that our children are taking and we say, what did I do? What, what caused them to go this way? And then we begin to judge ourselves of the list of excellence. Did I, did I yell at them? Did I, did I mistreat them? Did I, did I, what did I do wrong? And you go through all your wrong lists. I want you to throw that list away today. I want you to take it and I want you to crumble it up. And I want you to throw it in the garbage. Because that's where it belongs. I'm going to ask you a couple of very pointed questions. How many ever pray with your children? How many pray for them now? How many have shared truths with your children that they are not living in, but you share them anyway? How many, how many loved your children and you meant the best for them through their whole lives? Even though maybe they upset you and frustrated you and got you angry and hurt, you knew I love those kids. They know you love them. They do. They might try to twist it on you, but they know you love them. And you've been there for them when they didn't even deserve you being there for them. But you listen to me now. The enemy has battered and beat your minds because what he's done is instead taking all those excellent things that you did for them. How many times you paid them out of a problem? How many times you paid for their insurance when they couldn't pay for it? How, oh, come on. I, I'm going to talk to you for a minute. And you, you fed them all those years and, and when, when their husbands or their wives uh, you know, decided to go another direction, you took them back in and the kids and, and, you, and you helped raise the grandkids. But come on, I'm talking to everybody in this room right now. And when their marriages didn't work out, you hugged them and loved them and told them that you still loved them and, and it wasn't their fault. Come on. I, I, I'm just talking to you for a little bit. Uh, every time they did something, uh, you know, they, they uh, went to school and, and bailed out and, and uh, had detention. You went up there and stood up like a trooper and, and took the blame. But it must have been something you said or did that they're acting out the way they're acting out. And, and you listen to the psychiatrist say, and, and you know, the school psychiatrist you know, what is wrong with this child? What have you done? Let me tell you something. You need to understand that you have prayed. Now, I'm not saying some of you haven't done some wrong things. But the devil is the accuser of the brethren, not God. Yeah. Let, me, let me move to the side of excellence. For you that have paved the way and paved the way for your children and you've loved them. You're like that individual who one day after he's sown seeds to his field. And his workers came in and they were quick to say to him, Do you realize that there are thorns growing up in your wheat out there? Then they questioned his integrity of labor and efforts. They said, Did you not sow good seed? In other words, did, are you sure the quality of the stuff you put out there in that field, the seeds that you sowed? And he looked back at them and he said, I sowed good seed. This harvest is not a result of my lack of excellence or effort or energy. An enemy hath done this thing. While we were sleeping, an enemy has snuck in and sowed these tears. I didn't do this. For the first time in years, I want someone in here who's chained to the guilt and the accusation and the weight that every time your kids have fallen or made a mistake or, or sow things or read things in your life, you're going to have to realize, I didn't sow that. That's not the way I brought them up. That's not the way I taught them. That is not the instruction that I gave them. I sow good seed. I want you to look up without any guilt. Look up to God and say, Lord, you know I so good seed. Come on. I, I want you to recognize the excellence of your parenting. I want you to recognize how many times you tried and cried and wept and loved them when they were unlovable. Come on. I want somebody here to get a healing this morning. Amen. Some of you don't even know where I'm going with this message. But all you listen to what he said. I didn't sow that seed. That is not my heart. 
Somebody else sowed this. An enemy. I want to say to you, you're not the only one. Well, I'm getting ready to preach here, and I know what time it is. And I do care, but not that bad. You listen to me. I didn't have those children 24 hours a day. The school had my children a few hours and they were telling them about evolution and they were telling them about uh, perversion and they were introducing sex in the second grade and now they're starting to introduce pornography and homosexuality and bestiality and everything that you can imagine to three and four and five year or third, fourth and fifth graders. Are you listening to me? You don't have your children every hour of the day. You're not the only one sowing seed into them. While we were asleep or while we sent them to school, somebody else planted something. And uh, they weren't always in your house. They were out on the street corner with that lustful boy or girl. They were out there with the one who had a joint. And they were saying, hey, Billy Bob, uh, take a toke of this. Come on, don't. And then someone else say, hey, don't bogart, don't bogart that joint, my friend. Pass it over to me. He said, I didn't think you smoked. I never have. I just been around folks that did. I was there. I was there when someone come up with the crazy words like, don't bogart like that joint, buddy. I was there when the temptation uh, was there. But let me tell you something. There was something divested into me of excellence. I said, somebody had taught me and I want to share, somebody taught your children, and it was you. And though the enemy has put some tears there, they said, how about we go in there and just start ripping up the harvest now and start separating the wheat. Let's, let, let us go in there and start ripping up the, the, the wheat now. Come on, let us go in there and start ripping up those tares now and leave the wheat. But uh, he said, no, no, leave it alone. Just leave it alone. This is one of the hardest theological principles some of you are going to have to deal with. But it's a principle of excellence. There's some things you can't change right now. I said there's some things you're not going to turn around by yourself right now. There's some things you're going to have to just close your eyes and bow your knees and say, Lord, I'm leaving it in your hands. Here's what he said. Now listen to what he said. Leave it alone for now. This is a word for some of you that right now you can't solve these problems. You've done everything you know to do. I don't know why God's having me preach this message, but there's somebody here who needs this message. Right now, you cannot solve this. Right now, even though you have planted an excellent crop and you sowed excellent seed, you're not getting back an excellent harvest from your children or for other people that's been in your life. But I'm going to tell you something. Leave it alone. You say, how do I leave it alone? You turn it over to God. Cast all your cares on Him. For He careth for you. Leave it alone. God has this message for someone here today. Leave it alone. Put it in God's hands. He said, for there will come a day when... Listen to this. He said, at harvest time, God will separate the wheat from the tares. Now, if you sow, you got to get this. If you sow wheat, good seed into your children, then you got to believe God is going to separate those tares that somebody else sowed away from your children. And the good is going to come out and God will separate the good from the bad. He said, I will even allow my angels to separate the good from the bad. I want you to know the Bible said bring up a child in the way that it should go. Bring it up in Exodus. Bring it up in the way that it should be trained. And when he is old, there will come a day, God, even if it takes an angel to separate them from the good, from the bad, the tear from the weak, God will maintain the seed that you sown into your children. And God will separate. God will separate the bad from the good. All oh, this is hitting somebody's spirit because God, God is saying to you, is I'm going to, that child that looks like they're not coming back right now, that's wrapped in addiction and the tears of, of, of pornography and the tears of perversion and the tears. I'm talking about those things are straining their life out right now. But God said, it's still, I still see the wheat there. I still see the wheat. I'll separate. 
I'll take out at harvest time. I'll take the tares and rip them away from my wheat. Oh, listen to me. You that have a spirit of action are going to realize the final judgments and the final consequences are in the hands of God. And Daniel, in his actions, understood. Oh, King, this final judgment is not in your hands. It's in the hands of God. So I say to this nation, out of a spirit of excellence, I'm not going to give in to the fact that I'm chained or monitored or corralled by all your calls up in the House of Representatives or the Senate. I'm embraced and covered by God Almighty and His Holy Spirit. And I will continue to preach the truth of God's Word and I will continue to advocate that God is still the one in whom we trust in this nation. And that we're going to maintain a spirit of excellence when everybody else is crumbling and giving way to the tears that have been seeded in our lives to make us believe something that really isn't the truth. God will have the final say. Amen. How many understand that? Here's what I want you to do right now. I want every mom and dad, I want, I want everyone who has a family or a friend member who is just hurting so bad. Today, they're not here at church with you today. You know that they may be on some street corner. There's, in fact, there's certain areas of this air, high desert or where they live, you don't even want to drive by the street corners because you know they might be out there making a deal. They, 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 they may be out there running their con job, trying to get the hook up. You don't want to even go to their house no more. Because all their drug buddies and drink buddies and all the evidences of the chains in their life, you can see it before you ever get to the front door. You can feel it when you walk, the perversion, the darkness, depression. But laying there on that bed with a needle stuck in his arm or her arm, on an old stained mattress. He's your kid. And lying there, and I've said this so many times to you, is not a dying person, but a living promise. Yes. Because not only did you plant the right seed in that child, God put a seed in your spirit. Yes. That child will grow up to serve the Lord. Yes. And the seed of His Word, I will bring him back. No matter how far he runs. Lying there is not a dying person but a living promise. So today you lift that person up and say here he is. You separate the tares. From the good because it is like the wheat. Lord you, you separate that all that craziness that's going on in his life. Her life. And I won't be afraid to go and see your transforming world. I'm going to go down to that house. Because I know the Holy Spirit in me will not be will not be kept back by those big old Doberman pitchers or those pit bulls they got out there to keep the police at bay. And those locked windows. Mama, have you ever seen a little five foot one little mama grab a hold of the ears of a six foot four boy and point and say, No, I brought you in this world, boy, I'll take you out. Where do they possess such power? But they know in them they have planted seed and they brought them up the right way and they know. Mama, you know. Now, I'm only going to preach two more minutes. But I want to say to you right now, you listen to me, you listen to me well. Some of you need to turn those kids over to God because you haven't done such a great job and neither have I. Listen to me. Listen to me. We haven't done a great job in just resting 
in God's power to change their life. No, no, you thought I was going to say, you thought I was going to say, uh, and how good we did. We did the best we could do. Quit letting the devil beat you over the head. Amen. Quit letting the devil beat you over the head. You know, and I know, you did the best you could do and you still are. So what I want you to do is I want you to get up on your feet and I want you to throw your hands up and say, God, I put this kid, I put my children, I put that situation into your hands. And I'm going to quit letting the devil bombard me. <clears throat> With all these accusations and belittlements. Here, God, here's that boy, here's that girl, here's that spouse, here's that cousin, here's that friend. Now you say, what has this got to do with the spirit of excellence? I'm just started on this message. The first step of bringing excellence into your life is realizing, and this seems like such a, I want everybody to look at me, is when you've done everything in your, that's possible, you leave the impossible to God. And that was Daniel's great quality. My friend Harold Bredesen used to say to me almost every day, Ronnie, this father of the charismatic renewal, he would say to me, Ronnie, you do the easy stuff. You do what you can do. Leave the hard stuff to God. You do the things that are possible. Leave the impossible into his hands. Right now, you've done all you've known possible to do. And you know you have. Oh, you may have blotched it a few times and got irritated and raised your voice. And I understand that, but you know overall you just give your life for those children, for that setting, for your situation. I want you to lift your hands right now and say, Lord, <laughs> I've been a good seed. And I leave the harvest in your hands. I leave the harvest in your hands. Amen. You know you have. So I want all that guilt, I want all that hurt, all that pain. He said, but you don't know my boy's in prison. You don't know my girl's. In. She's chained up with all this stuff in her life. He can do that. He can do this. <laughs> and next one, Spirit says, God can do this. This is not in your hand, King Daniel said. This one didn't even in your grandfather's hands. This, this has been turned over to God. Oh, hallelujah. There, there was at some point in this message, there was a quickening in your spirit. God was not only speaking to you, but he was speaking a word of encouragement. Let it go. Leave it alone. It isn't that you don't think about it, that you don't pray about it. But you quit worrying about it, fretting about it, and doubting about it. I'm going to ask you all to lift your hands one more time and say, God can. Bless my child. God will, God will separate. separate. Oh, I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost. God will separate all those tears, those influences, those impacts. He's breaking it right now. Even if he needs to send an angel, he'll do it. Yes. So I want you to praise God. I want you to praise him that there's a... <laughs> there's not a dead boy there. Or a dying boy. There's a living blessing. That's not a dying daughter. That's a living destiny. I said, that's, that's not a dying daughter. That's a living destiny. So I want to lift my hands and say, it's in your hands here. You said, cast throw all my cares upon you, for you care for me. <laughs> oh, I'm talking to the one who just, but you don't 
know how far down they've gone. You don't know how, how angry they are at God and how angry they are at men and how indifferent they are. I know God. God said to leave it alone and put it in my hands. And I will take that tear, that indifference, that hatred, that malice, that vindictiveness, that, that bruised spirit, that, 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 that constant irritation that they live with. I'm taking that away from them. I'm pulling it away. Leave that in my hands. That rebellion, that stubbornness, let me separate it from them. I know what time it is. It's about eight minutes after 12. But let me tell you something. Those eight minutes were necessary to break some chains this morning. Amen. Amen. Some of you were sitting in a psychiatrist's office for three hours if you thought it would help that child. Sit eight more minutes in the service and see the chains. Believe God. Let the impossible be released in your life. Hallelujah. Take hands all over this building. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you want the chains broken in your life? You're tired of the hell that you're living in and through? If you die today, you're not sure you'd go to heaven? I'm not going to ask you to come down here and repeat a prayer. I'm going to ask you to run down to this altar, bow a knee to God, find a place to kneel. Someone will pray with you. If you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ, if you die right now, you're not sure you go to heaven. I want you to step out of those aisles. I want you to raise your hand right now and say, I don't know Jesus like you're talking about. I don't care if you've been in church all your life. You need to know Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. Amen. Not mama was saved or grandpa had an experience with God, but you. I'm going to ask you this question if you died right now. How many here could raise your hand and say, I know? Beyond a shadow of a doubt, if I died right now, or Jesus returned, I know I'd go to heaven. I know I'd, I know, I know, I know. Come on, lift your hands. I'm going to see it all over this building. I know I'm saved. I've trusted in the blood of Jesus Christ to save me from every sin. I'm looking for hands all over this building. Amen. If there was one in this building that was not able to raise your hand, you don't have that assurance. Would you come right now? Amen. Let us pray with you. Are you here? From this day forward, and it's been in our heart from years ago, but if you go to hell, if you are eternally lost, if you go into eternal darkness, you're going to have to work hard at it in this church. You're going to have to go over every song, every testimony, and every sermon, and every pleading at the end of every sermon. I'm not going to make it easy for you to be lost. I'm not going to be making it easy for you to just go on passively through life and not make that deliberate decision to know, know Jesus Christ. I know you're used to a pastor giving you an easy. Would you come and the invitation's there, take it and leave it? If I have to, I'll come back ten times. I'll beg you. I'll plead with you. Your soul is too important to me, to this church, to God. God loves you. Don't miss this opportunity. Don't let it slip you by. If you have someone standing near you right now and you love them and you're their friend and you know that they're struggling spiritually and that assurance is not in their heart. Don't be afraid in love, not in judgment, but in love to walk over, put your arms around them and say, would you like to walk up to the front with me? Let's pray together. Don't be afraid to invite someone to the greatest blessing they could ever have. Now, you knew it was coming. Look to your right. Look to your right. Say to the person, if you died right now, are you sure you go to heaven? Come on. You see, but I'm not even saying, that's okay. You're going to become an evangelist before you get saved. Turn to your right. Come on, everybody to your right. Ask that person. You see, but it's my wife. That's awkward. Turn to your wife. Turn to your husband and say, do you know Jesus? 
as your personal Savior. If you die right now, you sure you'll go to heaven. Now, you know what's going to happen. Turn the other way. Turn to the other side and ask the person the same question. If you die today, they just ask it to you. Now you turn and ask it to them. If you die right now, are you sure you go to heaven? Do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? Now, if there was anyone that could not say yes, if there was anyone I thank God for Vanessa's humble heart. She said, you know, Pastor, I, I just been through, and I don't think she'll mind. I mean, she knows where she's stepping down from. But there's a lot of things going on in my life because of her and pain. And, and I just need to get back to God like I should. I, I, I need to recommit. And uh, just bow you and start praying, Vanessa. But if there's anyone else here, say, Pastor, I, I've been in ministry, and I love the Lord. And, but the enemy's tried to sow tears in my life. Tried to strangle me out. The enemy has tried to captivate me and chain me. But I want to recommit my life to the Lord. I, I want the enemy chains broken in my life. If you're saved and you know it, but you, you, you know where you should be with God. You need to rededicate. This is a good opportunity right now. Amen. If the fires are burned dim, If pain, that's a tear. Wounds, hurts. Doubts set in. Step out of your chairs and walk up to the front. Someone will pray with you. Prayer warriors, I need you to come. They're beginning to come from all over this building. The young, the elderly, they're coming. I need to get the fire back in my life. I know where I should be with Jesus. We have so much spiritual pride sometimes that we forget how important it is to stay humble. Humble doesn't mean we grovel. Humble means we're totally dependent on Him. We stand in His righteousness. We need His help to break the chains. We need His help to break the depression. We need your strength. Bring back the joy of my salvation. Hallelujah. Bring back the joy of my salvation. Hallelujah. I want everybody to look at me. I am not a hellfire and brimstone preacher. I am a God's grace is sufficient. His love is ever reaching. His mercies endure forever preacher but it would be foolish for me to not recognize that there is an enemy there is a war there is a cause and we've reached a point where if I say nothing about it as a parent and I say nothing about it as a pastor, we just kind of overlook it, it might go away. It's not going away until somebody puts their foot down, puts their faith up. I refuse to let the enemy do what he's done before. And my faith says God's in charge now. I put it. You know, a lot of people, now I'm going to say one more thing. 
A lot of people say, you know, God's in control. Look at me. No, he's not. I'm sorry for your theology, but he's not in control of everything. He's in control of those things that you place in his hands. God does not have to intervene on every area of people's lives. He doesn't walk in every day and reorganize and re-straighten up Congress or the House of Representatives or the marijuana joint down the street. He doesn't run out all the evil or control it. Bad things can happen to good people. But I tell you where he is in control of. Cast all your cares on me for I care for you. Whatever you put into my hands for safekeeping, I am well able. So today, I'm asking you to do your part. I'm asking you to put your life in his hands. I'm asking you to admit there's something wrong in my life. I need your help. And I want those say, I, I, I'm, as you were preaching, I, my faith began to rise up. My foot came down, but my faith began to rise up. My foot went down against the enemy, the sowing tares. But my faith went up to a God who will separate the tares from the wheat. But I want those who took that faith stand. Amen. Put your foot down and put your faith up. I want you to lift your hands right now. Say, on behalf of my children, and behalf of my family, and behalf of my church, I put my foot down. Say, no, devil, you're not going to accuse me anymore. You're not going to belittle me. You're not going to make me think it's my fault. I've sown good seed. But my faith is God will separate my wheat, my babies. The seed that I've sown from that which the enemy has sown. Oh, I feel God in this place. God will separate me. Oh, God's going to separate your kids from some of those friends they've been hanging out with. Don't try to console to say thank you, Jesus. God's going to separate you from some of those people that have kept you down for years. Just say thank you, Jesus. Lord, I praise you. For all these that have come today, I reach forth my hand to them. I pray, God, that as they cry out, just cry out to the Lord right here. Say, God, every doubt, every fear, every ang angry, everything that's not of excellence in my spirit. Everything that's not of excellence of spirit, my spirit, my choices, my deliberate decisions. Heal me, deliver me, and set me free today. In Jesus' name I pray. Heal me, deliver me, and set me free. Now. You're going to set your foot down. Place your faith up. If, now listen to me. If perversion, lust, unnatural desires and appetites are eating away at your life and those tears are continually encircling you, go over there, get on your phone and disconnect your cable service that keeps feeding that problem. Shut down your internet that keeps you chained to that thing that you need to be loose from. You're going to have to take some steps. You're going to have to put your foot down and say, no, I'm not going to give you the opportunity to sow any more tears in my life. That, that soap opera that keeps you in suspicion of your husband and your wife, shut it off. If the news is causing you to be fearful and doubtful and, and, and you're living in depression, turn CBN, CBN in, turn them off. Get in on your knees and open your Bible and let the seed of His Word begin to encourage you, strengthen you, uphold you, and embrace you. You're a child of God. You can live in excellence. I didn't even get to my main scriptures today, but I'm going to say, Brother Fulker, I want to live in excellence. I want to have an excellence of mind and of spirit. Amen? We're dealing with first step today, and that is putting our foot down, giving our faith up, and believing 
that what we put in His hands, He will do. He will accomplish. Lord, we leave this place rejoicing you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. We thank you for the works that are being accomplished in this house. And we give you glory. And by faith, we call it done. Amen. God bless you. And remember, go with God. And God will go with you.